Hello. Yo, Axo, I have a video idea. You should do a lead code challenge in assembly. Today I'm going to find a super hard lead code challenge and try to solve it entirely using assembly. Now don't worry, if you know nothing of assembly, I will make sure you understand all along. So what is assembly? Assembly is not one, but a group of languages that are known for how closely related they are to machine code, the ones and zeros that your computer executes. Because assembly is a group of languages, there are many variants and flavors to choose from. Take the syntax for example. One very popular one is the Intel syntax, but you also have the AT&T syntax. In this video, the exact assembly language we'll be using is the Intel x86-64 assembly language. x86-64 is just a fancy way of naming 64 bits Intel and AMD processors. All right, that's really cool, but how do you read that? Well, the main thing to understand is that each line is what we call an instruction. The instruction will almost always consist of two parts the opcode and the operands. The opcode is short for operation code, and it is what tells your computer what to do. For example, here the opcode is add. In this case, what it does is perform an addition on two numbers. Operands, on the other hand, I'm not really sure what they're short for. All I could come up with is operation end, which would make sense because the opcode is the operation and operands come after, thus operation end. What the f am I even saying? Anyways, what they do is provide the data that the opcode needs in order to execute correctly. In this case, add takes two operands, 4 and 8. Some opcodes take no operands, others take only one, but most will usually take either none or two. Alright, let's take a little break from all this and decide which challenge we should do. But before doing just that, I would like to add something. Over the course of the past month, I've hired 500 Indians from Fiverr to code an artificial intelligence which, through triangulation, is able to locate every single one of you that isn't subscribed. If you don't want a 2s4 heavy mortar to fall in your kitchen, it will be all the more wiser to click that subscribe button, right? So what better way is there to find a challenge than to scroll through Lico's library? Median of two sorted arrays. I think this one will do. Given two sorted arrays, nums1 and nums2 of size M and N respectively, return the median of the two sorted arrays. So say we are given the arrays 1, 2, 8 and 1, 3, 8, our algorithm will need to return 2 because when you merge these two arrays together and sort the result, you get 1, 1, 2, 3, 8. And 2 is the median or middle element. If the final array was something like 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, 8, where it is even, we would return the average of the two middle elements, which would be 2 plus 3 divided by 2, so we'd return 2.5. But there's an issue. The description clearly states that our solution should be quite fast. An algorithm that simply merges arrays and sorts them couldn't be possibly fast enough. So somehow we need to have some sort of merging logic that does no merging. The trick is to split both arrays such that their last element of their left side is smaller than the right element of their counterpart's right side. When we meet this condition, we can be certain that both left parts combined together will represent half of the total array. Now, the question is, how do we do that? Well, we already know how many elements we need total when combining both left parts of both arrays because we know what the total size of them would be. With the arrays from earlier, that size will be 3 because the total size of both of these arrays together was 6, so we if we divide 6 by 2 to get the half of it, we'd get 3. But I think you get the point. With that information, we can figure out how many elements of each list we would take by simply focusing on the smaller of the two arrays. In this case, there isn't a smaller one, so we can just pick the first. We'd begin by taking half of the quote-unquote smaller array, which would be 1, because 3 divided by 2 is 1.5, and we ignore the fraction. We can figure out how many elements we need to take from the second list by subtracting the value we found from the total established 3, which would result in 2. These are the parts that we'd end up with. But wait, there's an issue. Yes, 1 is smaller than 8, this is correct, but 3 is bigger than 2, so this fails our initial condition. This problem tells us that we took one too many elements from the second list and one too few elements from the first. So all we got to do is to instead take two elements from the first one and which would imply that we now only need to take one from the second. 
All right, now the match works. Two is smaller than three and one is smaller than eight. What we just did is known as a binary search. We could have picked anywhere from zero to three elements from the first list, but every time a check fails, we try to narrow our search. If we didn't take enough elements, we take one more. And if we took too much, we take one less. All right, so now that we understand the algorithm, it's time to make things into code. The only problem here is that LeetCode doesn't support assembly. This isn't too much of an issue, it just means that we need to make our own testing environment. I'll go make the assembly code and then we'll go over the entire thing. Oh boy, this wasn't a pleasant task by any means. I ended up with this 334 lines of assembly code right here and some scripts. But don't worry, I'll spare your soul and I'll only go over what is strictly necessary. If you really want to check out the entire thing, a GitHub repository will be linked in the description. First, we got this bash build script. It's nothing too complicated. All it does is check that the required tools are available, assemble the code into binary while specifying that it's for a 64-bit its program. And finally, it links it into an executable. Then there's also this testing script. It checks that there's a build name main in the build folder and looks for a file called tests.txt. This file contains all the individual tests that are going to be run against the program one by one. And each of those contains two lists of numbers that are going to be input and the expected output the program should give. Now, of course, the lists are strings. So this means our assembly code will need to parse them into actual numbers. The testing scripts iterate over each of those lines and extract each individual argument and then runs the program, checks if it failed, and if it didn't, it's going to compare the output with the one it expects. When I build the program and I run it, as you can see, all the tests are passing. Now, right before we get into the actual code, there's a few concepts I'm going to need to explain. The stack is a last in first out data structure, meaning the last element you added would be the first one to be removed if you choose to do so. You cannot just decide to remove an element from the middle of the stack without removing the elements that are above that element. Every program has a stack. They use it as an extra memory location to do a bunch of things like storing variables and whatnot. I say that it's extra memory because that's not the only thing they will use. There's also something known as registers. They're just small memory units right inside of your processor, and they're also the fastest way of accessing memory. Back into the assembly code, the first thing it does is export a symbol called underscore start. You can use this symbol as a label to tell the linker exactly where the code is going to start. It's like the assembly equivalent of the main function in other programming languages. Any code you want to write needs to be within a dot text section. Sections are a way to divide an executable based on what each part does. The dot text section is for code, the dot data section is for initialized data, and the dot BSS is for uninitialized data. Back in the entry point, the first thing it does is reading the command line arguments it was given. If you've ever done some C or C++ programming, you will know that the main function can take two arguments, RGC and RGV. RGC or argument count is the amount of arguments it was given, and RGV is a list of pointers to the different strings representing each argument. Sadly, in assembly, you cannot just access those variables by name. Instead, they are placed on the stack with RGV being the first and RGC being the second. Here, the program is copying the value that RGC stores in the register RSI by accessing what the stack pointer is currently pointing to. The stack pointer always points to the top of the stack. And since RGC comes in second, we directly can just read it without just doing any special calculation. Then we need to compare it with the value three. Yes, we only expect two arguments, but there's always an extra argument that represents the command that executes the program. If the value is not equal to 3, then we make the program jump to exit with the exit code 1. This will make a system call to exit, which will make the program exit properly, all the while using the exit code 1, so we know there was a problem. If everything is fine, it will next get 
the second argument string from RGB by first getting its pointer and then accessing the correct string pointer by adding 8 bytes. Each pointer is of 8 bytes, so say we wanted to get the third string, we need to add 60. The next instruction loads the address of the list where it will store the numbers and the address where it will store its total size. After calling the function to parse the string into the list, it does the same thing again but for the second list. Parse string into list works by finding the size of each number it processes by going from their start and counting until it reaches either a comma or a null terminator. Once it knows the size of the number, it goes from the leftmost part of it and converts the digit character into an actual numeral value and multiplies it by its power. The conversion is as simple as subtracting its code by the code of the first digit character 0. The power logic works by multiplying it by 10 to whatever index it is. To figure out the index, it simply uses the size of the number it calculated earlier, minus 1, and decrements it every time it goes to a new digit on the right. This works because decimal is base 10. Say you have the number 234, if you wanted to turn the 2 from this number into 200, you do 2 times 10 to the 2, which is the same as 2 times 100, which gives 200. It repeats these steps for all the numbers in the string, and every time it processes one, it increments the list size number. By the way, I didn't go over this, but the way function calling works is that when you execute a call, it's going to push the return address on the stack, which will be the instruction right after this call. And when a return instruction is going to be executed, it's going to take that address from the stack, so it's going to pop it and return execution to there. If the call function wants to do any operations at all in between, it's going to have to back up important registers and values before doing anything with those. So one example is the base pointer. You're always going to see functions pushing the base pointer on the stack because it wants to back up the older base pointer that was set by the original calling function, and then it's going to want to restore it at the end because in between it's going to change that base pointer to its own value so it can specify its own stack range and then it's going to do whatever it needs to and right before returning it's going to pop all the values it pushed and then invoke the return so it returns to the correct address. Now, the last two remaining steps of the code is going to process the algorithm and then print its result. For simplicity, I'll only go over the algorithm's code, but if you're interested in really everything, again, you can look in the description for the GitHub link to the repository. Now, for the main algorithm, it starts by making sure that you're always going to have the first list as the uh, smaller array of the two. If not, it swaps both arguments of the size and the list itself with each other and then calls itself recursively. Then it sets up the binary search bound, so R8 is going to start at 0 and R9 is going to be set to the size of the smaller array. The main loop calculates the middle point between our bounds, figures out how to split both arrays, and then grabs those four key values we talked about earlier. It checks if both left values are smaller than their corresponding right values. If they are, we found the answer. If the check fails, it's going to adjust the search bounds. If we took too few elements from the smaller array, it increases the lower bound, and if we took too many, it decreases the upper bound. Once we find just the right position, calculating the median is pretty straightforward. For an odd total length, it's just the larger of the two left values, and for an even length, it's the average of the larger values on the left and the smaller values on the right. The remaining code is just going to print the value and then exit properly. Well, that was a hard decode challenge in assembly for you. It's a good thing that this isn't an interview question because it would be absolutely unhinged. The goal of this video isn't exactly to make you understand everything. It's more to show you how this can be done and that it's possible. So with all of this aside, I will see you in the next one.